All right, well, welcome everybody. It's good to see so many folks joining us live today. Um, welcome to the Grad Alting Workshop Series. Our topic today pertains to obtaining permanent residency status in the United States. I know that's an important topic to so many of you, so I'm glad you're here live. And welcome to everybody who's watching this recording. I hope it's helpful to everyone. Uh, my name is Debbie Mikutsky, and I'm the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid. I use she, her pronouns. So before we start the presentation, I want to make sure that everyone knows about legal aid, because in addition to workshops like this one today, we also provide a whole array of support to graduate students, um, to grad students who have legal issues, who specifically have legal issues that involve immigration concerns. Um, we assist those who've been charged by the university. I'm a notary, I will notarize your documents. Um, we put out a weekly briefing email, so we, we remind you what our upcoming workshops are, tell you about our services, give you some tips, and a little bit of campus news. Um, so if you paid your graduate student fee, then you've already paid for the services here at Legal Aid. There is no additional charge. So please don't hesitate to reach out, um, even if you're not sure if we can help you reach out anyway, because if we can't help you, we'll try to connect you to someone who can. So I will put um, our website in the chat when I'm done here. You can learn more about our services and you'll find instructions for how to request an appointment. So just a bit more housekeeping. Um, for those who want closed captioning, that has been enabled. Um, near the end of the workshop, we'll post a link to an evaluation. You know, we want your feedback, um, whether it's compliments, criticism, or suggestions. We need your help in making sure these workshops are helpful to you. Um, we'll email links to the evaluation, the slides, and the recording to everyone that registered. That probably won't happen till tomorrow. Um, the links are always posted on our website as well. So, um, and during this workshop today, we welcome your questions um, and comments throughout the workshop. Um, please use the Q&A feature. And it's also helpful, our, our speakers requested that you hold your questions until the end of the workshop. Um, and it will, because it, chances are she will cover that topic um, um, while she's finishing her presentation. So with that being said, let's get to the speaker. I am so pleased to welcome back and introduce our speaker, Patricia Minicon. Thanks for being here today, Patricia. Always a pleasure to be with the student body and the Office of Legal Aid. Great. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Attorney Minicon. She is the founder and owner of Minicon Law, which is a local company that specializes in offering comprehensive immigration services. Um, she has dedicated her career to immigration law, using her extensive knowledge and passion to advocate for the rights and interests of all of her clients. Um, Attorney Minicon also dedicates some of her time to consulting with students at the University of Maryland. Um, Legal Aid has contracted with her for the past seven years um, to provide one-on-one -on -one consultations for our international and immigrant students. So um, if you are interested in requesting a consultation with her, um, I will put a link in the chat so you can get right to that page on our website. So with no further ado, I will stop talking and turn everything over to Patricia. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Debbie indicated, I'm an immigration attorney um, with all, my office here in Greenbelt, pretty close to the school. Um, I've practiced immigration law for 30 years now. And um, it's always a pleasure to share that knowledge. And today 
I will be sharing with you how to obtain permanent resident status in the U.S. Um, we will cover humanitarian programs like asylum, U visa, which is the victim of crime, T visas, um, and VAWA, which is the violence against women, and it includes men. Um, we'll also talk very briefly about specialized programs for certain nationalities or certain occupations. Then we'll dive into family sponsorship, employer sponsorship, and self-sponsorship based either on an EB1, Extraordinary Ability Visa, or an EB2, which is an advanced um, degree um, coupled with a national interest waiver, and you're able to sponsor yourself for a green card. And also we'll cover the investment visa, which is EB5. Note, we're not covering um, in depth any, say, work visas like the H-1B or anything like that. I'm covering only programs that give you a pathway to a green card in the U.S., um, also called lawful permanent resident status. So with um, humanitarian programs, asylum um, is a benefit that people who apply receive if they can demonstrate that A, they're applying within a year of their entry, B, um, they are applying, or that they're applying within a year of change circumstances, um, and they would face persecution on five bases if they were to return to their country of nationality. And those five bases are religion, particular social group, um, race, political opinion, or nationality. If granted asylum, um, the person is, becomes an asylee and can file to get a green card within one year um, or one year after they're granted. Current um, policy provides that you can go ahead and file to adjust your status right away because it takes so long for USCIS to adjudicate um, adjustment of status petitions. When granted, you get one year's credit in asylee status, so you only need to wait four years to file for citizenship, whereas others need to wait five years in certain circumstances. The other humanitarian program um, that leads to a green card is a T visa. Um, the T visa itself is a temporary non-immigrant visa it is given for four years if approved. Um, the applicant has to prove that they have been a victim or se of sex or labor trafficking. And sex trafficking is defined as any kind of commercial um, sex act that the person was induced into by force, fraud, or coercion. Um, or if the person um, was induced into a sex act when they were a minor. That alone um, is substantial basis to apply. Labor trafficking um, is um, someone obtaining labor, your labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of involuntary servitude, peonage, dead bondage, or slavery. So if you work and you're not paid, um, that's involuntary servitude. Everyone should be compensated for their labor. So um, it applies in more instances than people realize. Uh, if the T visa applicant is expected to assist law enforcement in the investigation or the prosecution of the crime, and uh, T visa applicants can adjust their status to lawful permanent residency after three years. The next visa um, under the humanitarian program is a U visa, um, very similar to the T visa, except that there are 16 specified criminal activity that the applicant uh, must be a victim of. Um, a lot of these 16 crimes um, involve crimes against the person, like rape, murder, domestic violence, blackmail, stalking, 
witness tampering um, and other related crimes. The applicant must have suffered mental or physical harm, must help in the investigation of the crime um, or the prosecution of the crime. The crime must have occurred in the United States. And then the once approved, the U visa applicant is granted a temporary U visa for four years um, and they can adjust to law for permanent resident status after they have been um, granted for three years after. The final humanitarian program that we'll be discussing is um, benefits under the Violence Against Women's Act. It applies to males as well. The person has to be a victim of battery or extreme cruelty committed by either a US citizen spouse or former spouse, parent or child, or the person has to, the person who commits a crime has to be a lawful permanent resident. Um, and they would need to be the spouse, former spouse or parent of the applicant. Um, if the if a visa is immediately available due to the perpetrator being a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, then the applicant can apply for the VAWA benefits and um, adjustment of status at the same time. Um, this relief is also available when someone is in deportation or removal proceedings in immigration court. Um, they can apply to adjust their status on the basis of the abuse and the judge would grant it if they've proven their case. With the humanitarian programs, very, very generous waivers are available to applicants who have entered the US without a visa or has overstayed a visa. Anyone who has been unlawfully present um, for three years or 10 years would apply for a waiver and they would not need to leave the United States for three or 10 years. Um, and I'm sorry, I misspoke. Anyone who has been um, unlawfully present for six months or more, but less than a year, would need to stay out for three years, but if they're applying under a humanitarian program, like the U or T visa, that would be waived. It is automatically waived uh, if granted asylum and if granted VAWA benefits. Yeah, um, there are waivers available for humanitarian program applicants to waive convictions as well. All these pave the way to obtaining a green card and obtaining the U or T visa. There are green card programs based on nationality. For example, there are green cards for Afghans and Iraqis who were employed by the US government um, as translators and in some other limited capacities. Um, there are special immigrant juveniles. If you enter the US, while under 21 in most states, some states say under 18. But if you enter the US and you've been abused, neglected, or abandoned by one or both of your parents, um, so someone or one of your parents can file to obtain guardianship of you. And in so doing, uh, the judge will make special findings that it is no longer in your best interest to return to the home country of your parents. And if that happens, you would then be eligible after that family court judge renders that finding, you would then be eligible to file for a green card. There is sometimes a weight in this category, but the US policy allows for persons who have been granted a special immigrant juvenile petition to obtain a work authorization document until their green card is um, priority date is current. Broadcasters for U for U.S. Agency for Global Global Media um, or grantee of that agency 
would also be eligible for a green card, as would em retired employees of eligible international organizations or NATO. Um, former U.S. government employees abroad also qualify. For example, they worked at the U.S. Embassy as local staff. And um, most of these categories allow dependents to also receive a green card, dependents are spouses and children under 21. Now on to immigrant visas through family sponsorship. Uh, you can get a visa, an immigrant visa is the same as a green card. And so I'll use the words interchangeably. You can obtain an immigrant visa if you're the spouse, parent, child over or under. Well, if you're the petitioner, you have to be over 21 years old. But if your family member is sponsoring you, you can be over or under 21 years old. And um, if you're an immediate relative, meaning spouse, parent, or child, um, you are not penalized. And this actually should say child under 21 years old, not over. If you're a child under 21 years old, there's no penalty, no penalty if you're not in status, no penalty if your application for adjustment of status is within 90 days of your entry. So that applies to the spouse, parents, children under 21 of US citizens um, and permanent residents. It's just that for permanent residents, sometimes there's a wait for a visa. And so if you have a wait for a visa, certain bars apply, meaning if there's a wait for that visa, you have to be in status. Um, so, if you're an adult child of a U.S. citizen over 21 years, you do need to be in status um, in order for your parent to file for you and to allow you to just, just adjust status. Now, that status can be that you are on an F visa until you adjust status based on your parent's um, petition. Uh, spouses and unmarried children under 21 of permanent residents um, also fall in the preference category and they must be in status as well. Um, unmarried children of LPRs, which are permanent residents who are over 21 years old must um, also be in status. Permanent residents cannot apply or petition for their married children. Um, brothers and sisters of US citizens, you must be in status. Um, married children of US citizen you must be in status as well. So the only people who can get away with being out of status are the spouses of US citizens, parents of US citizens, children under 21 of US citizens. The process for applying for an immigrant visa um, is that there are forms you need to fill out and complete. And then there's uh, supporting evidence that you need to send in. So the forms would be the petition by the US citizen or permanent resident for the spouse. The spouse has to fill out a background form that allows the US to conduct a background check. Um, the petitioning spouse has to file an affidavit of support, which is a contract between that petitioner and the US government, which basically says that should the person being sponsored, who is also the beneficiary, should they acquire status and then need some assistance from the government, that the petitioner will assist the government per that contract to either reimburse the government or to pay um, for the assistance that the person, the sponsor needs. Um, the sponsor must meet the income requirements. There are requirements. They start at the mid 20,000 level. They increase every year just because of the cost of living adjustments. Um, 
then after submission of the application, uh, USCIS will conduct a criminal background check involving fingerprinting um, and biometric collection. And um, after that, if the person has applied for work authorization as part of the process and travel authorization, they would receive those documents and then later be scheduled for an interview or not, depending on the availability of a visa. USCIS recently changed policy to allow spouse, the spouses of US citizens um, and their petitioners not to be interviewed if they send in sufficient supporting documents to convince the officer that um, the marriage is bona fide and um, that they are commingling assets and liabilities. So the more documents of that nature that are sent in, the faster the processing can be because every time USCIS, USCIS writes to request documents through a request for evidence, it slows down the process. And um, family immigration um, does not benefit from any sort of premium processing. So the more complete the application, the faster the process, the processing. Um, if the parties have been married for less than two years, at the time the beneficiary spouse receives their green card or permanent resident status, they will receive conditional lawful permanent resident status and um, their green card, instead of expiring in 10 years, will expire in two years. Um, the effect of divorce on the conditional lawful permanent resident status is that um, if the conditional resident cannot uh, petition with their spouse, the petitioner, then the conditional permanent resident must seek a waiver. And that waiver um, can be based on the fact that the spouse entered the marriage in good faith, but through no fault of theirs, um, the marriage has ended. You do need to have a divorce decree in order to apply for this. If the, um, if the spouse, the conditional resident spouse was abused, they can file for a waiver based on that as well. Um, so there are those um, options. Now, there are penalties, strong penalties for fraud. Um, if the government concludes that the couple before it um, are not in a bona fide relationship, then the beneficiary will be barred from ever receiving a green card. It doesn't matter who the sponsor is. So it's very important when submitting these applications that you focus on submitting sufficient, um, sufficient documentation of the bona fides and of the marriage and the fact that you're jointly living together and sharing your life because um, USCIS can conclude that a marriage um, is fraudulent if there's a lack of sufficient documentation to prove that. The next um, category um, of path, the, the next pathway to obtaining a visa is through employment-based. Um, you can do this one of two ways, either have an employer sponsor you or you can sponsor yourself. We will speak first about employer sponsorship. An employer is able to sponsor someone who is an EB1, EB2, EB3, or EB4. The EB1 is for ext extraordinary ability um, persons. And we'll get into you know a little bit more about that later. Right now, this is just an overview. EB2 is for persons with advanced degrees, so masters or PhDs, or persons with exceptional ability. And then um, the EB3 
uh, is basically anyone with a degree. So it could be an associate's degree, bachelor's degree. And then there are others, um, there's another category of someone who has no degree, but maybe has experience. Um, and then there's the EB4. These are the special immigrants. The special immigrant juvenile um, pathway that I spoke about is an EB4 visa, even though it's not technically an employment based. Um, because it's based on, you know, um, abandonment, neglect, or um, by one's parents. The EB-4 is also reserved for religious-based um, people or beneficiaries. A church can sponsor potential workers as well, and they use the EB-4 category. The first preference, which is EB-1, they're considered priority workers. This um, encompasses persons with extraordinary ability in the sciences, the arts, in education, business, or athletics. It also includes outst outstanding professors and researchers. And the third category, which is EB1C, is certain multinational managers and executives. The second preference is for members of the professions holding an advanced degree, exceptional ability, um, and ability. Under this category, you have the ability to self-sponsor without a job offer. The third preference is EB3, is for skilled workers, professionals. Um, anyone with a bachelor's is considered a professional. Um, a skilled worker, other workers. Skilled worker is someone who has experience um, for the position they're being sponsored for. Other worker would include someone who has no experience or a job that requires no prior experience. Um, under this third preference category, uh, the employer needs to go through a labor certification or perm process. Um, so you do need an employer for that. Labor certification um, is required if you are in the EB2 category, but unable to self-sponsor with a national interest waiver um, and required at all times for the EB3 category, unless um, the EB3 uh, prospective employee meets certain um, requirements or they're in certain occupations. Um, the employer files the labor certification application with the Department of Labor, then goes through uh, the perm process, which involves advertising the position, um, meaningfully recruiting, which will be to place advertisements in about six publications. And then the employer has to prepare a result of recruitment report. This means that the employer has to indicate everyone who applied for that position and why they were not hired. Um, this would be everyone who is able to work lawfully in the United States. Um, and uh, if the Department of Labor does not feel the employer engaged in the recruitment process in a thorough manner, then the Department of Labor can require the employer to advertise and recruit a second time and this time it'll be supervised by the Department of Labor. So they will be seeing the um, resumes that come in and they will be making the decision whether they feel people um, should re be rejected for a legitimate um, job related reason. So, um, and that can delay the process when you're going through firm, which is why it's nice to be able to avoid labor certification. And um, avoiding labor certification is possible if you, your occupation is on Schedule A. Schedule A are occupations that the Department of Labor has certified to be in short supply in the United States. And as such, and as such no labor certification or perm advertising is required. Um, those include physical therapists, professional nurses and um, immigrants of exceptional ability in the sciences, arts, 
um, including college and university professors and immigrants of exceptional ability in the performing arts. So, um, and also the EB1 category um, does not require that. There are some benefits to labor certification, um, including the fact that if the labor certification application has been pending for more than 365 days, the person, if they're on an H-1B, can extend their H-1B visa beyond year six. Usually H-1B visas um, are possible for only six years, um, but if you've had uh, perm labor certification pending for 365 days, you are able to take advantage of that. The same um, for an H-4 spouse who can obtain work authorization if the labor certification or perm process has been pending for 365 days, or you have um, the employer petition, which is the I-140 has been approved um, and it's been pending, you know, the whole process has um, been pending. When um, when the employer gets through the labor certification process successfully, the employer then has to file the petition I just mentioned, the I-140. Um, this The I-140, if this is a employer-based petition where self-sponsorship is not possible, um, the employer files the petition after the labor certification has been granted. Um, and then USCIS usually will focus on the employer's ability to pay the salary. And um, if the I-140 or the employer petition is approved, then the employee can now apply for adjustment of status, which leads to lawful permanent resident status um, when a visa is available. Different countries have a longer wait than others, um, mainly China, India, Mexico, um, they have long waits. And this is where being able to extend an H-1B to maintain status until your green card comes through becomes important. Um, now, if you're self-sponsoring um, through say the EB-1 category, um, you no know, employer sponsorship is needed. You need to be seeking to enter the United States to continue working in an area of extraordinary ability. You also um, need to be entering the United States um, so that you will substantially benefit the United States in the future by your work. You will need to present evidence of prizes or awards, memberships in associations that require outstanding achievements, um, publications in professional or trade journals. You need to indicate um, that you've served as a judge of the work of others, or and you need to prove that you've made significant contributions in the field. There are other um, requirements that you need to prove, but these um, usually for students, these are the ones that they're able to prove and you need to show three out of 10. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, so prizes and awards would be prizes from well-known national um, institutions or professional associations. Um, it can also include a Nobel Peace Prize, but USCIS recently, like a few days ago, um, indicated that it doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize or a Pulitzer, you know, or an Oscar. So it can be prizes from well-known national institutions. Um, if you've sat on a doctoral dissertation, um, I'm, I'm sorry, if you've um, been awarded a prize for your doctoral dissertation, 
if you have received awards for presenting at national or international conferences, those count now as prizes or awards. Membership in an association that requires outstanding achievement means membership by invitation, not membership you can pay for. Publications in professional journals, that's fairly self-explanatory. This would have to be a professional journal in your field. Um, serving as a judge of the work of others, um, they just clarified as well. Completing peer reviews, excuse me, completing peer reviews um, for scholarly journal by request of the journal. You have to actually do the work and do the peer review, write the you know report in order to take advantage of this because you have to prove you completed it. Peer review of abstracts or papers submitted for a scholarly conference, peer review of um, abstracts or papers um, at a scholarly uh, for um, a journal and for a conference as well. Um, or if you serve as a member of a PhD dissertation committee where you were judging the dissertation of another person. And um, if you have done any sort of peer review for government research funding um, programs. Significant contributions to the field include published materials about your contribution, um, any testimonials or affidavits, affidavits from those in the field, um, citations to your work. This means um, the, a number of citations to your work that indicates that your work is being used in the field to further knowledge in the field. So the quality of the citations matter, um, not only the quantity. So both quality and quantity matter. And then if you have any patents or licenses, because this shows that you're contributing to the field as well. And as I stated, if people have questions, um, I won't answer them until the end. So um, that's when Debbie will be reading them. So please follow um, her instructions for getting me any questions. When you self-sponsor through a national interest waiver, um, you need to meet the requirements of the EB2 category, which are either an advanced degree or exceptional ability. Um, you need to show that the proposed endeavor has both substantial merit and national importance to the US. So the, your work that you're proposing, you be let into the US or given a green card based on has to benefit the entire country geographically, has to be capable of use in the entire United States and not just within your geographic, the borders of your state. You need to demonstrate your well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor, meaning you need to have a degree that would equip you with the knowledge and skills to um, advance this proposal. And STEM PhDs are presumed to meet two out of the three um, prongs of this test. They're assumed to be well positioned um, and their projects are assumed to have substantial merit. Um, otherwise, if you're not a PhD, a STEM PhD, um, then you would have to prove that, you know, you are well positioned and um, the project has substantial merit. You, the third prong everyone has to prove is that it would be beneficial to the United States to waive the requirements of job offer and thus the labor certification firm process. Um, in order to do this, uh, you would need to demonstrate how your program or project benefits the United States to such a level that, um, you know, 
even if they went through the labor process, the labor certification process, um, it would not make a difference. They would not find someone with your unique set of skills to do this. Um, with the national interest waiver, to recap, the employer petition is an employer petition is not required. You would fill out the form I-140 for yourself. No labor certification or perm process is required. That's what the national interest waiver does. It waives the labor certification or perm process. Um, if you have an interested government agency, it's helpful because then they can write to say that you know they're interested in your work, which lets you know, because if it's an interested um, federal government agency that lets you know this is of national importance because the federal agency covers all states. Um, you show, usually you want to submit letters in support um, from people you've collaborated with, worked with, so they can put your work in, pro in context and indicate why your work is important um, and how it contributes to the field. Your work can be an entrepreneurial project, but you still need to show um, that it is important. You still need to get the letters and support um, and prove that it has substantial merit um, and national importance and that um, they, it's, it, it's worth waiving the labor certification process. I did an in-depth national interest waivers training that's recorded on Zoom. And I've included the link in the slides so that um, you, when you get the slides, you'll be able to go to that training, um, which is at the Legal Aid, the Graduate Legal Aid's website and um, watch it if you want to know more in the National Interest Waivers. Um, you can self-sponsor uh, through investment, EB-5, pretty straightforward. You invest a million dollars, it has to be at risk, meaning it can't be in the bank. And you know that allows you to just withdraw it. Um, it's 500,000 if it's in an area of low employment. You could probably get that from the Chamber of Commerce or the Department of Labor. The investment has to create jobs. Um, at least 10 US workers have to be employed for at least two years. When you apply, if you have not invested this money for two years, you are a conditional resident. And after two years, you have to apply to remove the conditions by showing you did create the job for at least 10 US workers um, who have been employed for at least two years. So um, that's the EB-5 category. Um, next slide. There are some considerations you want to think about when you're applying for a green card. For family based, you want to apply when you can prove a joint life together and you have proof your marriage is bona fide. Meaning sometimes people are living in different states. If you plan on moving into the same state in the foreseeable future, then you may want to wait and have that because then it makes it easier to prove that you have a joint life together. Um, so there are just sometimes you need to think, can we meet this right now? Some people still live with their parents, so they're living in separate places um, and because they can't afford, you know, maybe to rent an apartment, then it, sometimes it's advisable to just wait until you're able to live together. Um, when you're self-sponsoring, U.S. law does allow you to pursue more than one pathway to a green card. So you could apply for an employer-sponsored green card and also file for a self-sponsored green card at the same time. If both are approved, though, you will have to withdraw one application because you can only receive one green card, even though you may pursue more than one path to it. Um, 
when you apply for a self-sponsored visa, um, you you need to meet all the requirements. So if, um, say, a STEM PhD receives stronger consideration, you need to wait until you have your PhD. If you're applying for an EB2, but you're, say, in year one of your PhD, you have to either wait until your department issues you a, a master's or ask, you know, apply for a master's, but you can be in the process of earning a PhD, but not yet actually have been awarded an advanced degree and apply for an EB2 visa. So those are some considerations to think about when it comes to timing, um, you know, and how you file your work authorization. For um, a green card through employer sponsorship, you if you will initially work using OPT or an H-1B visa before your employer files for your green card, you need to ensure that you time the filing of the green card application so that you still have valid non-immigrant status during the green card application process. Um, because that process can take a couple of years. For example, in Baltimore, family-based green cards are taking 21 months as of this month, and employment-based are taking 34 months. So it's very important to make sure you have coverage. Like for STEM OPT, you could renew up to 36 months. Um, that would be helpful because your green card will take 34 months if it's employment-based. And the same goes for family-based green card. Now, questions. Some people submitted questions in advance and I'll answer those first, and then we'll open it up for questions. We will have about um, a little under 15 minutes for questions. Um, for EB1 applications, when will the university submit the materials? For this question, and will the university sponsor a postdoc, you need to ask your department. Um, that is outside the scope of this presentation, and only your department would know the answer. Um, if a student has a home residency requirement, which is the 212E, um, because the person has had a J1 exchange visitor visa before, um, then to apply for a J-1 visa waiver, it's the only way to go about that, um, to get rid of the waiver, which clears the way for permanent resident status. And I understand that this um, waiver will also be required if someone served in J-2 status as a dependent of a J-1. So this would apply for J-2 as well. And um, I put the link to give you more information about the J-1 visa waiver. There are several bases you can apply under, and this link gives you those details. Um, if you had the option between a green card lottery and an H-1B visa, um, what would be more preferred uh, for a graduate? Well, one leads to a green card and one leads to a temporary work visa for six years. So it depends on what you want to accomplish. Do you want permanent status or do you want temporary status? And then the other consideration would be that both are lotteries, so you can play both. There is no prohibition. Um, one is a lottery for temporary status, the other is a lottery for permanent status. And now I'll take questions. Um, Debbie, could you please? Uh... Certainly, all right. Yeah, take a breather, Patricia. It's a lot of details. <laughs> All right, first question. Um, can an F1 student finishing a PhD apply for EB2 and W? Does I EB2... think I just addressed that. <laughs> okay. Well, um, the question was submitted earlier in the presentation. Yeah, yeah you, you uh, should, you're getting a PhD, you should wait until you have an advanced degree. So it could be applying to get a master's before you're done with the PhD or waiting for the PhD. Does the EB2 national waiver conflict with OPT? Yes, it does because um, 
you're applying to get a green card. Um, now, most of the time though, the way it is you apply for the national interest waiver is that you first apply for the immigrant part of it, the immigrant visa part. So you're not actually applying for adjustment of status. Timing wise, um, if you're on an OPT, say it's a STEM OPT, for example, and you've renewed it for the 24 month period, you can go ahead and apply for your, your NIW, your EB2 NIW, because you've already applied now, you're already on that non-immigrant status, and now you can apply for immigrant status. Okay, one more question um, to that, for that particular student. Can I leave the country during the EB2 national waiver process? Usually, no, not unless you have another, um, like a visa that allows you to travel like an H-1B. Otherwise, um, if you've put in um, for, if, anytime you put an immigration application in, if you leave the country, the conclusion is you've abandoned it. Now, if you've applied to adjust your status, you can apply for advanced parole, which is travel permission. And it would safeguard your trip against the conclusion that you've abandoned your application. All right, thank you so much. All right, next student. Um, will publications to reputed conferences count or is it just for journals? Um, if you mean like publication, like papers, when I present, we sometimes have to do a, um, a document, you know, article to hand out. Um, if that's the kind of publication um, you're talking about, like the conference publication, um, no, it this is publications um that are known nationally not just for the conference I, i'm not sure if this student wants to clarify um you know what yeah. right you may unmute yourself if you're still in the workshop uh hi so the question is basically like there are some uh, outside uh, journals, there are like, say, major conferences, like I'm a computer science student, so there are like major computer science conferences where people publish every year or so. So would that count also, or like would a journal paper count only, which takes like one or one and a half years to publish, basically, so. Yeah, um, when you say the conference, so you mean the conference publication. Right. Yes, the conference publication, essentially, which has like proceedings, essentially, like an IEEE conference proceeding or a AAAI or something like that, that's reputed all throughout the world, essentially, like that for computer science students. Yes. Um, you may be able to. You may be able to. I'm trying to go back um, to the National Interest Waiver. Um, let me see. You you know, that would be a trade publication. It sounds like, but with these things, you know, normally I would say, if say you were consulting with me, I'd ask you to point me to how I could see the publication or to look it up online. Um, it Because some, um, let me, how do I put this? Some associations print a monthly publication, and then they also print just a conference publication. And the conference publications are a lot shorter um, because they go with the presentation. They complement the presentation that will be given in person. Sure. But, you know, so um, just, it, it, this isn't really a question I can answer definitively. I would, I'm leaning on the side of saying yes, but I would have to see the publication. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. 
All right. Is there a way that parents of a U.S. citizen can apply for immigrant visa or green card while the U.S. citizen child is below 21 years of age? There is no way through the family immigration process um, for someone under 21 to petition for their parents because, as you have heard, um, the petition involves an affidavit of support. And children under 21, people under 21 are considered children under immigration law. And because you have to enter that affidavit of support, they will not recognize uh, someone under 21 as being able legally to file the petition. So no, but um, the humanitarian visas, you can. If a parent of a US citizen is a victim of a crime or is trafficked, they are able to file for one of the humanitarian visas based on harm to their child. They're an indirect victim in that scenario. So the humanitarian visas do um, allow that. All right, thank you. All right, next question. Are H-1B and EB-1, EB-2 applications considered independent? Can one have ongoing applications for both HB-1 and EB-1 at the same time? You can because the H-1B visa is one of the only um, or one of the few visas or non-immigrant visas that allow you to have immigrant intent at the same time. So you can um, pursue, and usually that is what happens. A person comes from OPT to H-1B to perm, permanent resident status through employment, and they're on the H-1B while their employer goes through um, the permanent resident uh, status process, the petition process for that. All right, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that STEM PhDs are strong for EB2, National Interest Waiver, Green Card. What about PhDs from the School of Public Health that don't fall under STEM? Well, um, it is USCIS policy to give STEM PhDs, um, you know, this presumption uh, of two, uh, that they've met two out of the three um, criteria. However, it does not mean that a STEM public health couldn't make the case. Something of national importance, like vaccine research, it is of a national importance. So a STEM PhD, you're, you know, you're still able to make your case. Um, it's just that you need to make all, you need to make your case for all three requirements, whereas a STEM PhD has slightly less work to do. All right, thank you. What does sponsorship mean? Does the employer have to pay for it? Sponsorship means an employer is petitioning the Immigration Agency of the United States to allow that employer to hire a foreign born worker and grant them permanent resident status in the US so they can work for the company. The employer is usually required to pay for any expense that is a business expense. And so by its nature, the petition is a business expense and should be paid for by the employer. All right, thank you. I'm a PhD candidate. Could you tell me if EB1 would be beneficial or EB2, which would be less competitive and take a shorter amount of time? That question, the answer to that question is individualized. And I would say if you want an individualized assessment, it would be better to schedule a consultation through the legal aid office. And the reason why is some people, what I usually do is go through your experience. If you have um, a resume or CV, I evaluate that to see how many, and then we talk about the individual requirements under each category. Um, 
and then I will see how many you're able to meet. So sometimes I'll do the evaluation and someone has two and not three out of the 10 that's required for the EB1. Um, and then may have all of it for the EB2 and the national interest waiver. So in that case, I would advise they go with the EB2 national interest waiver. So it's, it's an individualized assessment because the goal is not so much how competitive it is, is how well you meet each requirements. Okay, thank you. Patricia, it is 1.32 and I did only invite you for an hour. Would you like to take a few more questions or do you have other obligations? I can take a few more. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. All right, um, if I get more prizes or publications, would the chance of getting EB1 increase? Yes, it would, because you need three out of 10. But if you're asking, what I would say is the more factors or eligibility criteria you meet, the higher your chances. But if you're asking whether if you have say 10 awards and um, you know, 100 citations, well, that's only two out of 10 and you need three out of 10. So you, it's not the quantity under each category is that you have at least three categories. And then under each category, you may want to have more than one, just so it's not seen as like, oh, this is the only time, you know, um, and depending on the award too, because someone say who wins a Nobel Peace Prize, you don't expect for them to have more than one in one lifetime. So um, it's not only under the specific category, but across three categories, um, you need to have what they ask. All right, thank you. I'm not sure what this question is referring to. It's from Kenny. Um, it says, taking 34 months is quite long. Is there any way to expedite the process? Um, I think it's the EB. Let me go back. Okay. Kenny, if you want to unmute and clarify, that'd be great. Oh, I'm, I, I think I, I think. I understand. It's the processing times. It's at 34 months. Yeah. So for employment-based green cards, your employer is able to file for what they call premium processing. It costs $2,500. Um, and they can petition. When they file the I-140, the employer petition, they can ask for premium processing so that it goes through faster. But the adjustment of status, though, is another matter, and that you know can't really be rushed. So what you want to do in the employment base is submit everything, medicals, you know, submit everything because what happens is that if the officer gets to your case and your medicals say have expired or weren't submitted because they're taking so long, then the officer has to um issue a request for evidence which delays the process so submit everything and you do want to apply for a work permit during this time because you're able to work while you wait for your green card you're also able to travel while you wait for your green card so um you can file those travel uh, for travel permission and employment authorization to sort of ease the pain of the long wait as you wait. All right, thank you. It's one thirty-five. Do you want to stop now, or can you go to one? How many more do we have? We have six more, actually more than that. So you just set a time, Patricia, and then we'll stop. Okay, so I'll give it until one forty-five. Excellent. Thank you so much. And sure. to all the students that, you know, each situation is quite individualized. So if you want to request a consultation with Patricia, 
Um, please go to the link. I've put it in the chat. You can visit our website, click on immigration. Um, we will get you an appointment as soon as we can. So, all right, next question. When can a PhD student that just started his PhD um, and this person holds a master's degree start applying for EB2? Okay, if you hold a master's degree already and that is the degree you'll be using to advance your project for, on which you'll base a national interest waiver request, then you could start now because you already have the EB2. But if the degree on which you will base your project or the degree that will qualify you to advance this project is the degree you're currently working on, you have to wait until you actually get that degree. All right, thank you. All right, I am from Afghanistan with an F1 visa. Um, me and my F2 visa holder husband want to apply for asylum. Um, I need a pro bono attorney. Can legal aid of the university help in our case? So Patricia, would it be a good place to start to have a meeting with you? Um, and we can provide the student with resources beyond that. Yeah, um, so I also provide students with pro bono. If they need pro bono help, I have a list that I provide them. Um, I, I do pro bono, but I'm tapped out right now. Um, so, but I think a good place to start would be um, with an individualized consultation to, you know, because that kind of consultation can assess your claim, you know, and just give you some tips and hints um, and guidance as you locate, you know, a pro bono attorney. Okay, sounds good. Um, is there any way that parents of a U.S. citizen can apply for immigrant? Oh, sorry, I already answered that one. You already answered that one. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, once a green card is issued for 10 years, is close to expiration, and I want to extend beyond those 10 years, do I have to go through the entire process again, or will it be easier this time? Oh, yes. All you're doing is renewing your card like you're renewing your driver's license. So you just um, complete a form. It's called the I-90, and you just indicate, you know, your card is expiring. There's a box you check, and that takes about a year to get. Okay, not bad. Yeah. All right, how do fellowships play into EB2 national interest waiver applications? I'm sorry, what? How do fellowships oh. play into okay. EB2 national interest waiver applications? Um, I'm going to assume without clarification that um, the fellowship would be used to show um, that the person maybe has um, awards or prizes. And if that student is on the call or on the meeting, you can certainly yeah. clarify, please. Can you do? Are you still with us? You can unmute. All right. Going, going, he may have left. All right. All right. Okay, um, we've got five more minutes. Uh, what if yeah. the two degrees are related? For instance, I have a master's yeah. in public health. Oh, is someone speaking up now? Okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll start again. What if two degrees are related? For instance, I have a master's in public health and I'm working on a PhD in the School of Public Health. Would I still need to wait till I'm done with the PhD? Like I um, answered a question before, you need to already qualify for the visa type. So if you're doing an EB2, you do not need a PhD, but you need a master's. 
And you need to be well positioned to advance whatever project you're bas basing your national interest waiver on. So if you're, I mean, I, you know, two public health degrees can be in different areas. So it all depends on whether you're using your first master's to advance your proposed endeavor. Okay. Um, I am now looking at the other questions. So we have a few more minutes. Um, if I just want to use the OPT to find a job, but not apply for HB1 lottery, is this situation, uh, does this situation still need consideration as I need visa sponsorship? Let me um, it, can you read that again? It yes, was yes. If I just want to use the OPT to find a job, but not apply for HB1 lottery, um, maybe that we should have that student um, speak up. Chia? Will you what was the, oh, I'm sorry. What was the end of the question? Is this situation, does this situation still need consideration as I need visa sponsorship? Yeah, there's a thought missing. Or, right, or I'm not sure what they're yeah. asking. I'm so sorry. Chia, are you here? All right, I'm sorry, let's move on. Um. Okay. Yes, the slides will be shared. Okay. Some of these questions that are posted in the chat were also posted in the Q&A. So bear with me just a minute. Sure. So here we go. What are some things that art and humanities PhDs need to keep in mind while applying for EB1 or EB2? visas. Is there a minimum of number of years that we have to spend in the country before we can apply for a green card? All right. So this goes back to the considerations that I um, mentioned. You apply for the visa when you meet the requirements of that visa. So there is no, you know, the timing for each person may differ. Um, and there is not a specific number of years, um, but depending on when you apply and whether you are well qualified for that particular, um, visa category will have an impact overall on, you know, your application because so say, for example, you apply for EB2, you don't have an advanced degree and you're on an, uh, an F1. Um, if you, you, you may, that hopefully you didn't um, stop, you know, complying with the F1. That's a huge consideration. Don't stop complying with all the requirements of your F1 because if you try any of these processes and you're not successful, you want to have status to fall back on. So you need to still keep a full load, you know, et cetera, attend classes, meet all requirements. Um, though, you know, that's the main consideration. Do you have the requisite degree that they're looking for? Do you have any of the other qualifications that they're looking for? like for the EB-1, for example. All right. Thank you, Patricia. It is okay. 145, and you have, as always, gone above and beyond. You just can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you and I'll... Go ahead. I will be um, replacing the PowerPoint. There was a typo. Oh, there was? Okay. Yes. 
Oh, okay. All right. In well, a second. I will, I will hold yeah. off on sharing it. Yes, please. That's why I mentioned. As always, you did a wonderful job of presenting a complex and multifaceted subject for so many people in so many different situations. Um, I encourage folks to follow up with Patricia and request a one-on-one -on -one immigration consultation. I will follow up tomorrow with links to her presentation, to all the links that I put in the chat and to a link to the recording. So Patricia, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and volunteering your time. We always a pleasure. Appreciate you. All so, right. Thank you. And to everyone right. else, um, have a good week. I hope to see you next week. Um, next week's workshop is how to buy a car and take care of it. I always learn something new at these workshops. So I hope to see you there. And um, thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.